Usaka Sakabo, and welcome to part four of the read aloud of Caciques and Semi Idols, the web spun by Taino Rulers between Hispaniola and Puerto Rico by Jose R. Oliver. Um, in the last video, we stopped at chapter 10, so um, that's where we're starting today. Chapter 10 is the display of semis, personal versus communal ownership, and private versus public function. Earlier, I described the aniconic semis, the stones wrapped in a satchel, that shamans extract from patients to capture an illness to be kept by the patient afterward. These and other small semi-objects like this were most likely for personal and private use and devotion, unlike some of the larger semi-idols entrusted to the caciques and possibly to the Nitaino elite as well. By virtue of their relationship with elite members of society, the sphere of action of the semi-idols, their power, was one that affected the well-being of a polity and of the population at large. These semi-idols have to do with the public affairs of government and not as much with the well-being of any given member of society. This does not preclude the fact that caciques and itainos also had these kinds of personal, private, quote, talismanic, end quote, semi-imbued objects. Like other colleagues, I suspect that many, if not all, of the small three-pointers are of this private or personal kind, and that their effects were accordingly limited to one person or perhaps members of a family. To these one, to these one might add a wide range of necklace, pendants, and danglers depicting semi-icons. Following Jeff Walker, a distinction must be maintained between, I mean, quote, between communal or group ownership and personal or individual ownership, end quote. On the one hand, and, quote, public visible to the people and private visible to the individual use, end quote. On the other, emphasis in the original. The focus in this book is on those semi-icons that were engaged by caciques and political leaders, those whose actions affected the affairs of the state, of the population at large. To use Walker's terms, these are semi-idols meant for public use, not to be confused with, quote, used or seen by the public, end quote, for public display. I agree with Walker that the larger semi-icons were probably personally, quote, owned, end quote, by the caciques and itainos, and that their function was public, i.e., personal public objects. Certainly, the monumental semi-petroglyphs carved on the monoliths demarcating plazas, or bates, were for public use and display, visible to all. I would clarify, though, that the portable objects, perhaps also the monumental semi-petroglyphs, were not owned, but rather entrusted to the cacique, not because I argue for a community-wide ownership, but because, from the native's animistic perspective, these semi-icons were not inherently or always under the absolute control of the cacique, as animated beings, as persons, Semis could abandon and did run away from the cacique. In that sense, no one can own, short of slavery, as property such semi-personages, just as the cacique did not own the naboria. On the other hand, runaway semis could be recovered, and others that were stolen could be induced to perform for their human trustee, as there are descriptions in Pané of these being tied up and placed inside a sack that is, immobilized. Thus, the semis' free will, like the humans, could be curtailed. Walker suggests that the larger, more voluminous icons were also meant for public display, most particularly the large stone collars and elbow stones, but also the larger three-pointed stones, some of which were likely to be strapped or tied onto the outer panel of stone collars. Given the meaning of the word semi as, quote, sweetness, end quote, as that which is imbued with numinous potency unknown to Walker at the time, I'm reasonably satisfied that this term applies to stone collars and elbow stones as much as it does to the miniature three-pointers. However, like Walker, I strongly suspect that the larger, highly decorated semis, encompassing the four classes noted, were intended for use in affairs pertaining to the public, the community, and the polity or, quote, public use, end quote, and on marked occasions for, quote, display, end quote, too. 
It is very likely that the stone collars, elbow stones, stone heads, three-pointed stones, duhos, wooden idols of various kinds, and the like were also publicly displayed at particular times during the year, as would all the regalia of the caciques and itaino, which included the guaiza pectoral, necklace pendant, and guanine plaque with semi-iconography. But more frequently, the ceremonies and rituals where these semi-icons were used, invoked, consulted, and negotiated with were those taking place in the privacy of the chief Scane. They were visible to a select group, as we shall see shortly. This does not mean that the community at large did not envision or know what generally went on inside the Cane, but they were not ocular witnesses to or active participants in these ceremonial rites. Walker proposed, quote, if there were many semi-artifacts available, they were probably personal objects. If there were few, they were probably public objects, end quote. Using stone collars as an example, Walker devised a simple test. He assumed that Hispaniola had four or five paramount chiefs, as Spanish chroniclers suggested, and that the total number of chiefs per generation remained constant in a 700-year period. Walker further assumed that generations changed every 20 years at a minimum or every five years, 50 years at a maximum, which would translate into a total of 35 or 14 generations in 700 years of paramount chiefs. The result would be that a total of between 56 and 140 stone collars, quote, would need to have been made in Hispaniola over the estimated period between 8800 and 181500 for them to have been personally owned items by the principal caciques of the island, end quote. If the actual number of stone collars were within the expected estimated range, then it would reflect that these were personally, quote, owned, end quote, and used by the principal caciques, one per cacique per generation, but, quote, many fewer collars in the archaeological record can mean that they were carefully curated and therefore public, public property, end quote. Walker's test was meant to be just a rough indicator. He assumes that only paramount chiefs would have a stone collar and that they would possess only one through their lifetime. He also assumes that rather than their heir inheriting the stone collar as an heirloom from the deceased cacique, a new one would be carved too, for example, commemorate ascension to the office. Hispaniola did appear to have four or five chiefs who could be labeled, quote, paramount, end quote. But it is clear that stone collars were never produced, used, or even traded outside the southeastern region of Casimujigüe. Hence, all stone collars in that chiefdom were destined, destined for the one presumed paramount chief. The other four or so paramount caciques should not have entered into Walker's calculations. Furthermore, it is still an unresolved matter whether Puerto Rico ever had paramount chiefs as did Hispaniola or whether their casicasos were in essence peer polities, also called casicasos by the Spaniards. A final point is that over the 700 years, the native political system in both islands had to have changed to some extent or another, even cycled from simple to complex and back to simple as suggested by Timothy Palkatat and David Anderson for chiefdoms in the southeastern and midwestern United States. Rather than arguing as Walker does for personal public versus communal public ownership, I suggest that what the fewer than expected samples relative to numbers of chiefs would mean is that these lithic collars were curated and maintained in circulation via inheritance, as I will later argue. Walker observed that up to 1993, there were only 182 examples of stone collars, of which between 90 and 106 were complete and provenance to 22 sites or district areas in Puerto Rico. As a result of Suez Barillo's study, the total has since increased to 465, of which 275 are complete specimens and coming from some 52 sites or distinct areas. The increase to double the number might mean that these stone collars were not just in the hands of two or three paramount chiefs, if there were ever any such paramount chiefs, but also in those of local or subordinated chiefs in Puerto Rico. If one looks exclusively at the rates of new stone collar production per year, per generation, and disregards for whom the stone collars were being manufactured, the results ought to give a rough estimate of just how frequently new ones were produced. It goes into what table one below um, shows 
in a 700 year period and then goes on to say that both data sets do suggest a low yearly average rate of production. If these data are recalculated in terms of the number of new stone collars produced per generation, the figures will of course increase. So I'm going to scroll back up real quick so you guys can see the table which is the estimated average production of stone collars in Puerto Rico, AD 800 to 1500. And the table is, the first column is total lithic rings produced in a 700 year period, uh, 182, which includes fragments. Um, then 102 excludes fragments. Then 475 includes fragments and 275 excludes fragments. Um, these references are from Walker in 1993, um, the first two, and then the last two from Sued Barillo in 2001. So then the next column is the number of lithic rings produced per year. And in order, it's uh, 0 0.26, 0 0.15, 0 0.68, and 0.39. The next column, the third column, is the number of lithic rings produced per generation. Um, and this says that it assumes a 25 year, assumes 25 years for each new generation. In 700 years, there are a total of 28 generations. So um, the numbers would be 6.5, 3.6, 17.0, and 9.8. And then the last column um, is the number of lithic rings produced per generation. Um, which assumes the 45 years for each new generation in 700 years, which means that there would be a total of 15.6 uh, generations. And the data that follows is 11.7, 6.5, 30.4, and 17.6, with the technically last column being the references I, I made earlier about um, the first two uh sections, the first two rows of data being Walker from 1993 and the last two rows of data being Suez Barillo in 2001. So back to the reading. Assuming a shorter 25-year span for a generation turnover and using the more recent data from Suez Barillo, between 10 and 17 stone collars were produced per generation. Assuming a larger, more unlikely, 45-year generation turnover, the average production would be between 17 and 30 per generation. Thus, yearly production rates are low, but in terms of the total new stone collars per generation, the figures are higher. If we assume that only one new collar was commissioned for every newly installed cacique, i.e. a new generation, then Suez Badillo's figures suggest that Puerto Rico had between 10 and 17 caciques assuming a 25-year generation, or between 18 and 30, assuming a 45-year generation. The latter figure seems to be somewhat closer to the total number of important caciques known for Puerto Rico during the Spanish contact period. Clearly, the conclusions that can be derived from Table 1 are predicated on far too many shaky assumptions. The most important is the unrealistic assumption of political stability over seven centuries, that is, an unchanging number of secessions of caciques per generation, followed by the equally untestable assumption that a new stone collar is to, com is to be commissioned every time a new cacique inherits the office. Still, the rates of production are generally small compared to many other kinds of non-perishable objects that could qualify as potent or powerful political religious artifacts. However one looks at the data, the average rate of production per annum can only be described as low. As such, it does make sense to claim that on average, few, individual, few individuals would come into possession or control of stone collars. Given these low yearly rates, it's quite possible that the older existing stone collars would be curated and thus remain in circulation. Example, kept in the family. This challenges the assumption that in every generation, the installment of a new chief would necessarily require the commission of one new lithic ring. Chiefs may even have had an incentive to keep the lithic ring that belonged to his or her ancestor chief rather than to, the, rather than to commission a new one, as the old stone collar would already have an established reputation. Finally, as Samuel Wilson 
Personal Communication 2007 observed, quote, broken fragments may still have power, value, prestige, and history, end quote, which raises further questions about the issue of stone collar production and replacement rates. And, of course, the same could be said for fragments of other semi-icons, such as the three-pointed stones. For larger and highly decorated three-pointed idols, the number is higher than stone collars, but certainly these are not run-of-the-mill. Admiral Columbus did note that in Hispaniola, quote, the majority of the caciques had three separate stones to which they and their people had great devotion, end quote. At least one of the stones, quote, that is good to cultivate cereals and legumes that they planted, end quote, is known to have included the three-lobed form. The encomienda census led by Alfonso, Alfonso de Alburquerque in Hispaniola in 1514 recorded 401 caciques, 401 caciques, with this figure representing only a fraction of what the cacique population would have been in 1492. Like Hispaniola, Puerto Rico at the time of Spanish contact also had many local caciques, which would account for the larger number of known archaeological three-pointed stone specimens. The much greater number of caciques in Hispaniola in 1514 relative to the number of three-pointed stones, stone collars, and elbow stones suggests that only high-ranked caciques would have them. However, the 1514 statistics for Hispaniola have to be modified to exclude all regions outside the distribution of stone collars and large three-pointers. That is, it should only consider it should consider only the southeastern region from Santo Domingo to Casimu. For Higüe or Casimu, the total population was 1,189, of which there were five caciques and two nitainos. Santo Domingo, with a total of 77 caciques out of 7,171 souls, is excluded since it is quite clear that many of the assigned Indians were brought from far away to serve in the capital and work in the royal hacienda. The smaller number of chiefs in Higüe seem to correlate with the low number of large stone collars recovered in this region. Unfortunately, I do not have figures for the total number of stone collars or of large three-pointed stones thus far known for the Dominican Republic, but all of my colleagues insist they are fewer in number compared to those found in Puerto Rico. In the end, lacking statistics, more precise dates, and contextual data, especially provenance, for these objects makes this exercise speculative. What is important, though, is that ancestors to answers to the question raised will go a long way in understanding the overall value and importance that these objects had and tell us about how many and how frequently they were in circulation. The issues of personal versus public use and especially ownership among the Taino are all the more relevant when one examines the geographic distribution of the semi-icons in question. What can be given and what cannot, or as Annette Weiner and Maurice Godlier put it, quote, giving for keeping, end quote, end quote, keeping for giving, end quote, revolves around the question of who controls the destiny and circulation and thus the social relationships of these objects, keeping also in mind that the, that the aborigines believed that these idols were personages capable of independent motility. They could run away to, quote, other beings, end quote, and to other places. The questions of rarity versus abundance in in any inalienability and alienability and thus a measure of perceived value also in he, in here on resolving questions about how many and how often these things were available for circulation and for inheritance because these iconic objects do seem to be fairly rare within an area of maximum geographic distribution even in Puerto Rico, I suspect that on the stone collars and other such prestigious semis would be curated and passed on, even when new ones were probably entering the arsenal of powerful semi-idols that caciques kept in their canelles. Walker did not consider that semis accrued prestige and reputation over time while they changed hands from trustee to trustee. That alone provides a strong incentive to, what cu to curate semis rather than to retire them from circulation example, burial or ritual killing, and thus be frequently replacing them with newly minted ones. Chapter 11. Face-to-face -face Interactions. Semis, Idols, and the Native Political Elite. 
When a cacique had to make strategic decisions about policies that affected governance, he usually convened a council meeting in the privacy of the cane attended by a retinue of his closest advisors, probably those of Nitaino status and, on important occasions, by subordinated or allied caciques. He then initiated the cojoba ceremony, invoking the appropriate semi or contingents of semi in order to consult and divine what they had in store for the future should this or that policy be implemented. Bishop Las Casas narrated one such council gathering conducted behind closed doors in the cane of the cacique. Las Casas does not tell us when such an event took place. He spoke from personal experience, but also as a recollection elicited much later when he was back in Spain. However, his experience is a generalization I'm willing to accept as applicable to Hispaniola in Puerto Rico. They had the custom of convening cabildos or council meetings to determine arduous things, such as mobilizing for war or other things that they thought important for performing their cojoba ceremony. I saw them sometimes celebrate their cojoba. The first to start was the señor, or cacique, and while he was doing it, the rest remained quiet. Having done his cojoba, which is inhaling through the nostril those powders, as it was said before, and were absorbed while seated on low and well-carved benches they called dujos, he remained for a while with his head turned sideward and with his arms resting on his knees. Then he raised his face to the sky, speaking his truthful words, which must have been their prayers to the true God. Or the, or the one they had for God. All responded almost like when we say, Amen, and they did this, and this they did with great pomp of voices or sound. Then they thanked him and said flatteries to captivate his benevolence, and begged him to tell them what he had seen while in his trance. He would give an account of his vision, telling them that the semi spoke to him and certified the good or adverse times to come, or that they would have children, or that they would die, or that they would have conflict or war with their neighbors. Such hallucinatory encounters entailed praying to, in the Latin sense of prepisis, quote, to obtain by entreaty, end quote, perhaps also negotiating with the semi so as to extract a favorable outcome and to divine what the future had in store, and therefore find out if or when it would be wise to implement a proposed action or policy. The cacique would then tell the Nitaino advisors of his visions and interaction with the semi, and then, I assume, it would be roundly discussed and debated by the council members. The agenda set for this kind of cojoba ceremony, as gleaned from Las Casas' Las Casas's quote, is to deal with matters that concern the polity's welfare and security rather than any one individual's needs. The order of access is very clear. The cacique, not the bejique, which is not mentioned, has the prerogative to communicate directly with the semi. The rest of the assembled have to wait for the results of the exchange. In this instance, the semi invoked may be in fact the idol or set of idols pre present in the cojoba ceremony, which minimally included the dujos, on which the cacique and elite sat, the, quote, canopied, end quote, wooden idol holding the tray or platter with the hallucinogen, and the decorated bifurcated tubes for snuffing the drug and who articulated with the central idol as columbus noted these may also be the potent idols that in concert summon the numinous presence of an unsubstantiated semi-force apprehended by the cacique through an altered state of consciousness induced by the cojoba drug for instance oviedo explicitly tells us how the cacique seated in a dujo is not alone but rather that it is he and his semi quote, adversario, quote, or opponent, which Oviedo equated with the devil of Christianity. This may not be a prejudiced misconception by Oviedo. The semi of the dujo could, in fact, be the cacique's true opponent, since many of the semi described by Pané do have a, quote, dark side, end quote, with powers that are dangerous and capable of untold calamities if not properly controlled by the cacique. When a cacique literally sits on his adversarial companion, he's sending a strong visual signal of his ability, power, and knowledge to control the dujo, the dujo semi. Admiral Columbus noted that Taino chiefs, quote, had a house for each one, separated from the town, where there is nothing but some of the relief-carved wooden images that they call semis, end quote. Such houses, or canes, were in effect temples dedicated to service the semis, for ceremony and prayer, quote, 
No se trabajaba para más efecto que para el servicio de los semis, con cierta ceremonia y oración que ellos hacen ahí, como nosotros en la iglesia, end quote. And in English, that translates to all the work is done for no other effect or purpose than to serve the semis with certain ceremony and prayer as we do in church, end quote. He further noted that, quote, they venerate one semi more than the others, and I have seen them venerate more and be more reverent to the one than the others, end quote. Probably reflecting the pecking order of the semis on the basis of their seniority, genealogic descent, and reputation accrued through time, as argued earlier. Thus, it is clear that while the cacique engaged the numinous, unsubstantiated, semi-spirit, he was also surrounded by iconic images and sculptured idols that were themselves semi, the dujo, the canopy cojoba idol, and even the Y-shaped inhaling tubes were often decorated with carved images of semis. Also included might be other decorated paraphernalia used in preparation for the hallucinogenic trance, such as vomiting spatulas and effigy pestles to grind cojoba seeds. But one or a few of those legendary senior idols were the central figures of devotion, as Columbus noted. The cacique and counselors were thus not alone in invoking the semi as spirit and as idol. The cacique was interacting with a complex network of semi icons during such divinatory encounter encounters. <clears throat> Excuse me. The impact that such semi idols had in the running of earthly political power and on the ordinary folks did not escape Columbus's attention. He told, secondhand, a famous story about a group of Spaniards who, despite the natives' wariness, entered a cane with semis. As the cojoba ceremony progressed, the Spaniards heard the idol, quote, shout and speak, end quote, in the Taino language, which they couldn't understand. One of the idols described conforms to the archaeologically known, quote, canopy, end quote, idols, but there were also was a central idol that spoke. The Spaniards told Columbus that the whole event was a hoax, indeed a lie carried out by the cacique to subjugate the population to his will. The account goes as follows. And it so happened that on one occasion that they were weary of us, the Christians entered with them, the natives, into the said house, and suddenly the semi shouted loudly and spoke in their language. From this it was discovered that it was made with artifice, because it, the idol, being hollow, had fitted in the lower part a hollow crane or trumpet that extended back into the dot dark side of the house covered with foliage where there was a person that spoke what the cacique wished him to be said as much as it can be intelligibly spoken through a trumpet as a result our people suspecting what it could be kicked with their feet the semi and found it to be as i have said realizing that we the spaniards had discovered that trick the caciques begged them with great insistence not to tell anything to his vassal indians nor to others because with this trick he held them all in obedience. Because of this, we can say that there is a shade of idolatry, at least among those who do not know the secret and deception by their caciques, because they believe the semi is the one that speaks, and they, are, and they all are, in general, so deceived. Only the cacique knows and conceals such false credulity that he uses to extract from the people all the tributes he wants. The above Cojoba ceremony presents a somewhat different scenario than the council meeting Cojoba discussed earlier. In this instance, it is the semi-idol who speaks to an apparently larger audience, Spanish intruders included. The cacique's assistants, perhaps a Mexica or shaman, verbally relays through the fotuto, a Taino word for trumpet, hidden in the semi-idol, whatever transpired due the during the hallucinogenic visions and consultations that the cacique had with the semi-spirits. Of course, at a simplistic level, this is how the political religious elite held sway over their subjects, as Columbus noted. But at another level, the, quote, trickery, end quote, is unlikely to have been perceived as a, as a deception or hoax in a sort of Marxist, Machiavellian, Machiavellian or ideolo ideological plot by the cacique to extract tribute from the, quote, ignorant, uh, end quote, assembly. I suspect that speaking through the hollow cane transformed ordinary speech into sacred speech. It communicated what was revealed to the cacique and his assistant in our Western view, the actual speaker, during hallucinatory ecstasy. 
I would be surprised if the natives assembled in this house were not well aware of the hidden fotuto or that a human being was actually speaking through it. If indeed we're dealing with individuality, partability, and with extended persons, both the semi-idol and the speaker are dialogic persons capable of vitality and not surprisingly of speech. The Spanish, not understanding what was said through the trumpet, had missed what probably was a speech pattern, a cadence distorted through the fotuto that in itself was of divine origin. The inner workings of the semi, its hollowness, the trumpet, and the hidden men are supposed to be secrets knowable only to the initiated for those in authority. It is even possible that the cacique and perhaps also the speaker were still under the influence of the hallucinogen, that such knowledge was privileged. That such knowledge which privileged is, of course, a key source of chiefly power. The Spanish were well aware of this, even though the motivations of trickery attributed to the elite and the presumed stupidity of the non-initiated non masses are in all probability wrong. The knowledge coming from the visions and other sensorial experiences under the hallucinogenic drug are real enough to the cacique and are what believers need to confirm the presence and animacy via verbal instructions of the semi as idols and as a spiritual force, and it is the context that the cacique begged the Spaniards not to betray the secrets of the ritual. Ignorance of the natives' multinatural perspective and partability of persons precluded any reasonable interpretation of this event by 16th century Spaniards. Bishop Las Casas reported on other Cojoba ceremonies that were public in the sense of being more inclusive. He contrasts the two close-quartered ceremonies described above with those where, quote, all of the principal people of the town gathered, by permission of the vehicles or priests or by the senores, to conduct this sacrifice that they call cojoba. It was a pleasure to watch them, end quote. Unfortunately, other than inhaling the cojoba, there are no descriptions as to what, as to what roles, if any, the semi-idols may have played in such public festive occasions. I suspect that some semis may have been taken out of the cane or the cave and publicly paraded. Chapter 12, Hanging on to and Losing the Power of the Semi-Idols I would suggest that it is in the ritual context of cojoba divination and ecstasy that a cacique's efficacy as a leader was tested. He had to demonstrate dexterity in controlling, negotiating, extracting, and interpreting the will of all the semis entrusted to him. As noted earlier, there is solid evidence that even powerful, reputable caciques during times of crises could and would lose control of their semis. The legend from Hispaniola featuring Opiel Guobirang, a four-legged dog-like idol, tells of his repeated escapes from a cacique, of the struggles by the latter to keep it in the cane, to the point of needing to tie up the idol with rope. This legend also gives us to the gives us the specific reason of why Opiel Guobirang finally ran away never to return. The semi's permanent abandonment was linked to the arrival of the Spanish. In the legend, blame lies squarely on the Spanish conquistadors. The silent implication is that the cacique had lost control of Opiel Guobirang because of his inability to cope with the devastating effects of the Spanish conquest. The cacique's strategies and policies on countering the Spanish failed because he failed to extract support from the semi. The idol abandoned him. The cacique was powerless to control the unraveling events due to his repeated failings in predicting what was to come. Not even tying up Opiel Guobirang prevented his permanent departure. The abandonment of any semi-idol would undoubtedly imply a loss of face and prestige for the cacique and would have the potential to create opportunities among his political rivals to assume or at least contest his leadership. For... For living caciques to govern effectively, they had to maintain control of an appropriately powerful contingent of semi-icons, those with tested reputations and with, and with legendary status. This also means that legendary, powerful semi-idols could not be or ordered upon, demanded by a cacique in order to buttress or aggrandize his reputation and power. The implication of theft for the spatial distribution of semi-icons is obvious. There are bound to be semi-idols that did not originate in the settlement, region, and perhaps not even from the same cacicazo where they were first created. To effectively rule, caciques had to be locked onto the powerful semi-idols, specifically those that had the greatest reputation and therefore antiquity. It's not surprising, therefore, that the caciques strived to both protect and hide these idols from rivals, and that they also boasted having the most powerful, as Columbus noted, quote, 
The caciques and their people boasted having a better, i.e. more powerful, semi theirs against the others. And when they go to their semi and into their house where it is, they guard it from the Christians. And the natives do not let them enter. Rather, if they suspect they're about to come, they take the semi or semis and hide them in the forest for fear that they would be that they would take them. End quote. Yet bragging about having the best, most reputable or powerful can only work if, in fact, the cacique and their semis could consistently deliver what was required of them. The same quote, however, adds one other interesting observation. Quote, what is even more laughable is that they, the caciques, have the custom of stealing the semis from each other, end quote. Zealously guarding the semis and the threat of theft go hand in hand. Theft is likely to be part of the reason why in some of the legends recorded by Pane, the idols, quote, escaped, end quote, or are portrayed as difficult to keep in the cane and thus tied with ropes. Perhaps in some instances, escaping would then masquerade for stealing. In any event, whether by theft or not, the abandonment of a semi is an indictment of the cacique's incompetence. At times, bragging could have been a genuine boast that the cacique would indeed have the best, the quote, best, end quote, semis. But then if a cacique did have them, why was there a need to steal their chief semis? Let us examine this phenomenon a bit closer. Las Casas recounted the same story of bragging about and the theft of semis, but also added that the natives hid them away not only from the Christian, but also from, quote, other Indians of other kingdoms and señores, fiefdoms, end quote. But why would the stealing of semis between caciques or elites be hilarious or laughable to Columbus. It is, I think, because of the paradox of boasting of having the best and most powerful semi-idols and yet constantly stealing those of other competing caciques or lords. This being the case, Columbus, Columbus ran wrongly assumed that they blatantly lied or greatly exaggerated the powers of their semis. Hence, for Columbus, that was the motivation for cacique stealing them. Obviously, theft would be no laughable matter for the victim. To begin with, there is a better than average risk of going to war to recover the idol or avenge the aggrieved cacique, not to mention the loss of face by the victim. The fact remains that the caciques did steal semis from other cacique. The question is why? What circumstances would lead caciques to steal them? I think that Columbus hit the nail on the head. It was because the señores lacked the appropriate semis, because caciques needed potent semi-idols to rule effectively. Columbus failed to realize, however, that what fueled the exaggerated boasting and the frenzied thievery was the political crisis, the crisis that the Spaniards generated through battle and conquest. Important chiefs like Anacaona, Caonabo, Guarionés, Iguanamá, and Mayobanés were either drowned, hanged, or burned at the stake within the first decade of the arrival of Columbus to Hispaniola. Not only were principal caciques executed, but often a whole line of preferred heirs and subordinated caciques was wiped out. The most infamous example was when Chief Des Anacaona, but for her own execution by hanging, had to witness 80 of her allied caciques being burned alive inside her large cane in Jaragua. Most probably all the wooden semi-idols stored in that cane were also burned. As Hugh Thomas tensely put it, quote, all the native rulers encountered by Columbus in his first years were dead, end quote, by 1504. This created both a power vacuum among the top ranks of the indigenous leadership and an acute problem of secession throughout Hispaniola by 1503. Puerto Rico had experienced the same crisis following the rebellion of the caciques of 1511. I have argued elsewhere that the various contradictory statements made by the chroniclers on the issue of the, seces of the secession routes to the office of chief exists not just because the Spanish did not fully understand the native system of descent and inheritance, but primarily because the customary or preferred rules could not be applied. Whichever way the, native look, the natives looked, the preferred heirs were, far more often than not, taken out of content, contention. During this particular decade, between 1493 and 1503, of severe sustained crises in Hispaniola, Secession to the office and inheritance of the chiefly, quote, estate, end quote, included a variety of routes already discussed in Section 2D. I suspect there were other routes as well, but the point is that these all seem to be contested, negotiable, and even ad hoc given that the preferred options could not be implemented. Such a situation allowed ample room for competitors to forward alternate routes, even new ones not tried before, to benefit their chosen candidates. This could have included the possibility of a stranger becoming, 
becoming a cacique, as was the case of Caonabo, who was born in the Luqueño Islands, or the Bahamian archipelago, archipelago outside the Hispaniola chiefdom of Baguana. As noted earlier, the increased theft of semi-idols among chiefs is partly a reflection of these problems of secession. All of this secession maneuvering was taking place amid battles of Spanish and ally caciques against loyalist, anti-Spanish chiefs. If indeed the ability to effectively govern the cacique required a powerful and potent set of semis, especially those idols with proven, proven reputation and legendary status, it's of little wonder that theft was rampant. The proposed heirs, who probably were well down, if not out of, the preferential line of accession, ascension, uh, probably did not have the semis required for making the tough political and military decisions needed to confront the Spanish and their allied caciques. The heirs may have come from Nitaino factions, not in direct line with the deceased or absent cacique, thus unlikely to have the required set of legendary semis. The theft of semi-idols from opponent caciques who were militarily allied with the Spanish may have been encouraged as well by, quote, loyalists, and quote, caciques. The two points to be emphasized in this business of theft is that caciques, one, could not effectively rule and garnish military support without semis that had long established reputations and legendary prestige, and that too, those lacking them had to steal them simply because such legendary, reputable, well-tested semi-idols could not be manufactured to order. Even if newly minted semis, semis became available, and even if they were powerful, i.e. of high rank and status at conception, they had yet to acquire their reputation for efficacy, always vis-a-vis -vis their human trustee. These new semis had yet to show that they could be effectively controlled and manipulated by the cacique in order to bring about good to society or calamities to their enemies. It would appear then that excessive bragging and theft of semis among caciques was a desperate strategy for desperate times. Although this was in response to the Spanish conquest, it's quite likely that such a strategy was also deployed in pre-Columbian times during similar crises. Given such a scenario, the implications of archaeology of the escape and theft of semi-idols are that any number of these icons would end up far beyond the settlements or areas where they originated from, and very likely in different chiefdoms as well. Many others that remained in the local area would end up being hidden from the Spanish and other enemy caciques. One likely place, one likely place for hiding would be in caves, many of which were already sanctified abodes where the Cojoba ceremony, ceremony was most likely linked to rituals commemorating buried ancestors or related to the pictograph or petroglyph images carved or painted on the walls. Not surprisingly, a significant number of the wooden statues, duhos, and other ceremony semi-idols held in museums and private collections worldwide have come from caves, rock shelters, or, or hagueyes. And pictured is... Uh, the Greater Antilles, a map of the Greater Antilles, and um, the Lesser Antilles. So figure one, it reads, map of the Caribbean showing the circumscribed area of the distribution of four classes of semi-icons, large three-pointed stones, stone collars, elbow stones, and large stone heads. Then here you have figure two, which is a selection of three-pointed stone semis from Hispaniola, A through I and J through M are from Puerto Rico. And then it says, inset J, K, two miniature three-pointers in coral, K, and limestone, J, that first appeared during the archaic period and continued to be pro produced until the Spanish contact, cheek and austenoid period. Then it says specimens L, M, and M squared, or M2, um, Museo de Historia, Antropología y Arte Universidad de Puerto Rico, Specimens A through 1, Museo del Hombre Dominicano, Specimens JK, Fundación Arqueolo Arqueológica, Antropológica e Histórica de Puerto Rico, now defunct. That may not be a 2 next to the M. I'm not sure. Moving along to figure 3 on the next page, Stone Collar, Elbow Stones, and Macorís Stone Heads. A is a slender stone collar from Puerto Rico. B is a slender stone collar detail from La Parguera in Puerto Rico. And C, two coarse stone collars from Eastern Hispaniola. Uh, D is an elbow stone from Puerto Rico. 
E is the Macorís type stone head from Hispaniola, frontal and lateral views. Um, specimens A and D through E are from the Museo de Historia, Antropología y Arte Universidad de Puerto Rico. Specimen C, Museo del Hombre, Dom Hombre Dominicano. Specimen B, Peabody Museum of Natural History, Division of Archaeology, courtesy of Professor Richard Berger. And then figure four is another map of um, the Caribbean. And it shows, it says, figure four, distribution of cultures and peoples according to Irving Rouse at the time of Columbus, A.D. 1492 to 1520 in the Greater Antilles. And this next figure looks pretty complicated. Figure five, the standard cultural chronology of the Windward Passage, Mona Passage, and Virgin Passage areas in the Greater Antilles. And the next thing is figure six. And what it depicts is ceramic bowls used for inhaling hallucinogens. So figure A is a, quote, turtle, end quote, effigy bowl of La Hueca style with spouts fragmented. B is the exterior view. And C is interior views of a Hacienda Grande style bowl fragments showing the spouts and orifices for inhalation. And they're from the Colección Museo de Historia, Antropología y Arte Universidad de, Universidad de Puerto Rico. Specimen C, Centro de Investigaciones Arqueológica, University of Puerto Rico, courtesy of Luis Chanlate Baic. Hopefully I'm pronouncing everything correctly. Um, the next figure is figure seven, and they are devices for inhaling hallucinogens or cohoba inhalators. Um, figure A is a wood anthropomorphic tube holder. B is a deteriorated strombus shell tube holder. C is an anthropomorphic tube holder made of a manatee rib. D is a simple Y-shaped tube holder with inhaling tube missing. E is a reconstruction of a combined spatula and tube holder made of strombus shell. F is a tube holder, quote, C, end quote, showing where bird bone tubes are inserted. And then specimens A and B, Cueva El Faro, Puerto Rico, specimen C, La Cucama in the Dominican Republic, specimen D, uh, the Cotosai in Isabela, Puerto Rico, specimen E, Cueva de la Cojova in Ciales, Puerto Rico, specimens A, B, C from the Colección Museo de Historia, Antropología y Arte Universidad de Puerto Rico. Note, specimen E has been reconstructed with Photoshop. The original is slightly more than half complete. So figure eight is a spread of calibrated radiocarbon dates, uh, two sigma associated with Rouse's ceramic styles. Uh, Cuevas to Santa Elena. The overlap of dates clearly suggests that instead of these styles succeeding one another, a large degree of contempor contempor contemporaneity existed and that a plurality of styles is the norm of Puerto for Puerto Rico from about AD 400 to 1200. Figure 9 is the decapitated, quote unquote, Personage found in the main plaza of Hacana, Ponce, Puerto Rico. Left, a view in situ, center, a frontal perspective. Right, a preliminary drawing. Photographs left and center, David Daner and New South Associates, and with permission from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in Jacksonville. Figure 10 is an example of the dual natures of a, quote, frog human, end quote, person, personage modeled in ceramic. It's hanging on and looking into a Santa, Santa Elena style open bowl from the Vacia Talega site, Puerto Rico, former collection of Dr. Andres L. Oliver. And this is figure 11. Wooden semi-idols involved in Cojova ceremonies. Left, A, a 39-centimeter tall anthropomorphic idol from Carpenter's Mountain, Jamaica. Right, C, a 65.5-centimeter tall bird turtle idol. Both semi-idols show overhead 
the round platform to place the kohoba or hallucinogen. At the center B is a small 39.5 centimeter anthropomorphic semi idol with splayed legs from Jamaica, um, trustees of the British Museum. Then we have what look like, I'm trying to scroll slowly so y'all can see. Figure 12. Petroglyphs and pictographs are here interpreted as a class of non-portable semi-icons. A. The rock boulder from Salto Arriba Utuado. B. Monolith monolithic slabs um, framing the central plaza at Caguana. C through D. Petroglyphs at Cueva de, Ver Cueva de Verna, Higüe, Dominican Republic. E through F. Are pictographs at Cueva de Lucero, Juana Diaz in Puerto Rico. G, petroglyphs from the Central Plaza at Bate de Delfín in Yagüez, Mayagüez, Puerto Rico. And chalk has been added to enhance the design in petroglyphs A, B, and G. Photograph G, courtesy of Juan Rivera Fontan. Now, figure 13 is a diverse sample of small semi-artifacts used for body decoration or for personal use from the Dominican Republic. A through F. Uh, qualify as stone pendants. G through A are oninomorphic vomiting spatula finials. H is a bone plaque slash pendant. I, a miniature three-pointed icon. K, a spatula finial depicting a fantastic saurian semi. L, a pendant cojova inhaler depicting a bat semi with spatulas doubling as wings. And all specimens are from the Museo de la Fundación García Arevalo in Santo Domingo. Figure 14. We have three-pointed stone semi with detailed anthropomorphic facial features that lend it lend it identity and personhood from the Turabo Valley Caguas, Puerto Rico. Courtesy of W.A. Gagel, I think. And then... The next figure, 15, is a wooden semi-idol with a rounded platform to hold a hallucinogen, and B, a Boca Chica-style ceramic effigy vessel depicting a shaman or cacique on a dujo while under the influence of Cojova. Uh, Museo de la Fundación García, Arevalo, Santo Domingo. Figure 16 is a bird semi, 87 centimeter tall, made of guayacan or guayacum officinale from Carpenter, Carpenter's Mountain, Vere, Jamaica. This sample may represent a woodpecker. Melanerpes spp period, given by its quote patch and quote or outline of feathers on the forehead. It's likely to be one of the central or primary idols of veneration, the trustees of the Irish Museum. Figure 17 is an 100-foot centimeter tall male anthropomorphic semi-idol with splayed legs from Carpenter's Mountain, Vere, Jamaica. The broad tear canals on the cheeks probably represent the physiological reaction to the cojoba drug. This is also from the trustees of the Irish Museum. And figure 18 is a highly polished guayacan dujo or seat with gold sheet decorations. The back seat design or inset represents the cotton belts used with a Taino, with the circular designs possibly representing the perforated shell disc sewn into the belt um, from the trustees of the British Museum. Chapter 13, The Inheritance and Reciprocal Exchange of Semi-Icons. If theft was a desperate measure, how were such powerful icons passed on to others under normal, peaceful circumstances? Giving with the expectation of a future reciprocal gesture is one way, although the 16th century chroniclers only recorded it for the death of caciques. It is likely that in life caciques may have gifted semi-idols to others, although perhaps such idols might have rarely been those regarded with the highest esteem. Inheritance seems to have been the normal way in which semi-idols changed hands across generations. But inheritance and disposition of the estate of a deceased cacique is a complicated matter, for instance, in addition to the bequest to the heir, 
to the office and possibly close relatives, there was also what might be bequeathed to other people, such as political allies and other distant relatives, along with what the deceased would take with him as burial furniture and would thus be permanently taken out of circulation. The first two, inheritance by heirs and gifts to others, are of importance since they would account for the spatial distribution of most semi-idols within and between islands. Admiral Columbus, as noted by his son Hernando Colón, described various funerary practices reserved for caciques only. In some circumstances, the Hispaniola and caciques were burned in the house where they died. In others, their bodies were disemboweled and then desiccated over fire, after which the bones, usually a skull, to be buried or enclosed in blankets, calabashes, or cotton idols would be selected. Columbus mentioned that some caciques were also buried in caves, along with offerings of cassava bread and a calabash full of water placed over their heads. But Oviedo is the only one to provide some detail of what happened with the material wealth of a dead cacique. He wrote about another funeral ritual reserved for caciques in Hispaniola. Funeral areto, a dance and chant, performances eulogizing the deceased cacique were organized around feasts that lasted up to 20 days. To these funerary feasts, many subjects from within the cacicazo were invited to participate, as well as other principal caciques coming from regions afar. In such occasions, Oviedo specifically noted that the part of the estate of the dead cacique was to be distributed among the invited foreign caciques. In Oviedo's own words, After the death, the cacique was tightly fastened from feet to head with very long cotton-woven bandages, and in a hole they placed him, as in a silo, and there they placed him on his jewels, and those things he valued most. They built a wooden dome so that the earth would not touch him, and sat him on a well-carved duho, and then they covered it with earth, and the dances, and the dances songs that they sang and the Indians did, or aretos, with many others from the comarca, neighborhood, or region, and other principal caciques came to honor him, among whom, said foreigners, the belongings of the deceased were distributed. As the funerary feast lasted around two weeks, there is no doubt that the caciques' extended kin would have to outlay great amounts of drink and food. The length of the feast was most likely dependent on the wealth and resources accumulated by the cacique and his kindred. In other words, this was an expensive display of the cacique and his relatives' wealth and resources. The cacique would then be buried, wrapped in cotton bandages, seated on his duho, and placed in a pit chamber frayed by woman be framed by wooden beams and planks so that the soil would not touch him. The duho, of course, is one of the items of grave furniture that displayed a semi-idol. However, Oviedo is not very specific about what else might be buried with the cacique except for a vague mention of jewelry. The latter seems to indicate the inclusion of selected items of personal body decoration, such as his stone bead or siba, pronounced siba, like I just said it, necklace. It is anyone's guess what precisely might be the things, quote, he valued most, end quote, and how many items, how many such items would be buried with him. Such things, however, would be permanently taken out of circulation, unavailable for future exchange or as bequests for descendants. The meaning of the term, quote, foreign cacique, for, quote, foreign, end quote, cacique, is tricky to interpret. It means likely, it most likely refers to caciques who were not direct blood relatives of the deceased cacique and whose political domain lay outside that of the deceased chief. I suspect that this category also included those caciques with whom the deceased chief had a fine relationship cemented through marital relationships, although it may also have included caciques with whom political alliances were cemented through means other than bridal exchange, that is, through the Guatiao ceremonial pact. The redistribution of wealth to foreign caciques and funerary feasts implies that a significant portion of his possessions remained in circulation, and I strongly, strongly suspect that among these were some semi-idols, perhaps not the most valued or highest ranked, but potent semi-idols nonetheless. To bequest part of his wealth to foreign caciques appears to be an effective mechanism to ensure reciprocity, to henceforth obligate these foreign dignitaries to lend their full political, economic, and military support to the new heir or heiress, much in the same way they had when the deceased cacique was alive. It's also likely that there were marital ties between the deceased chief's lineage and the families of caciques from other chiefdoms, packs that may have been cemented through the Guatiao ritual, which would often include wife exchanges, making the caciques and the recently deceased chief brother-in-laws. At this point, 
The heir was still neo, a neophyte cacique, an untested individual in the eyes of all concerned, but by virtue of his descent ties to the dead, and thus semiophyte cacique, and being the person who was in the ideal position to inherit the office, he had all the support needed to become a competent ruler and leader. The foreign caciques would reciprocate the gifts received during the funerary feast by providing such support, thereby increasing the new cacique's chances of success. However, only time would tell how effective and successful the heir would become, since it would take time to build his reputation as an effective leader and to show that he could control the powers of semis, as idols and as numinous spirits, he had inherited. The giving of valuables, including semi-icons, could therefore be interpreted as a mechanism to enhance and buttress the new chief's chances to succeed in his new role as cacique. At the same time, accepting gifts placed the foreign cacique at a disadvantage with respect to the heir cacique and his kindred, as Godlier noted, given thus see, giving thus seems to establish a difference and an inequality of status between donor and recipient, which can in certain instances become a hierarchy. If this hierarchy exists, then the gifts express, expresses and legitimizes it. The gift decreases the, di the distance between the protagonist because it is a form of sharing and it increases the social distance because one is now indebted to the other. It is easy to see the formidable array of maneuvers and strategic strategies virtually contained in the practices of gift giving and the gamut of contradictory interests that can be served. By its very nature, gift giving is an ambivalent practice which is capable of bringing together opposing emotions and forces. It can be an act of generosity or of violence. In the latter case, violence is disguised as a disinterested gesture. Of the two components, sharing and debt, contained and combined in gift giving, it is the second, the social distancing, which probably has the greatest impact in social life when it is organized around various forms of competition for access to wealth and power, knowledge, or ritual. By accepting the gift, the foreign cacique becomes indebted and would reciprocate by lending support to the heir, who at this point was in a fragile position as a neophyte cacique, especially in the, especially in the eyes of political enemies or even factions within his cacicazo. I presume that at a future time, upon the death of one of the foreign caciques, the now much more experienced and mature heir cacique would be invited to participate in the funer funerary feast and receive gifts bequeathed, bequeathed by the deceased foreign cacique, even perhaps expecting the return of the semi-icon that he and his kin gave to the deceased cacique in the funerary feast conducted years or decades earlier. The net effect of the circulation of such semi-icons among a series of caciques and across generations is that their prestige increased as their reputations grew, and thus accumulated deep and, quote, sentimented, end quote, biographies and legends built around their relationships as they circulated from one cacique to another. Circulation, in this case, is across a generation of caciques. A few of the semi-idols reported by Pané have this across-generation exchange process recorded by the list of the caciques who had it in their possession. The fact that richly furnished burials with abundant offerings involving objects of wealth and prestige, identifying a cacique, are not archaeologically known for the greater Antilles, dovetails with Oviedo's claim that much of the estate of the deceased cacique remains in circulation. There are perhaps less than half a dozen archaeological burials in Hispaniola known to have yielded relatively wealthy burials, such as at La Cucama Juandolio, near Santo Domingo. But the, quote, richest, end quote, burial was found by looters. It included thousands of pink coral microbeads, a richly carved manatee bone, cojoba inhaler, a small statuette with gold inlays in the eyes and mouth, several loose gold sheets, and a Macorís-type stone head that suggests either an important shaman or an elite individual. These items are today on display at the Museum of the Fundación García Arevalo in Santo Domingo. Burial finds such as this one are exceptionally rare in Hispaniola and do not seem to even come close to the description of the material wealth said to be controlled by caciques of the Spanish contact period, such as Anacaona. The exception confirms the rule. The material wealth, the estate of a cacique, remained in circulation and formed part of a, of a reciprocal exchange system involving foreign caciques. I will return to this theme of giving and taking in the next section where alienable versus inalienable wealth is also discussed.
in Puerto Rico and the adjacent Virgin Islands, despite far greater archaeological activity than in Hispaniola, not a single burial site can yet be regarded as that of an elite, be it cacique or nitaino. Moreover, Jeff Walker noted that large, decorated, three-pointed semi-idols have not been found in burial contexts except for one possible instance at the Hacienda Grande site in Puerto Rico. Certainly, the same can be said of the elbow stones, stone collars, and the large stone heads. In my own research region of Caguana, the municipality of Utuado in Puerto Rico, fragments of stone collars were found in association with midden refuse at a farmstead site, U-27. The only large three-pointed semi, the so-called half-moon moon type, was a surface find near El Bate, site U-20, while two small semis were respectively uncovered from a midden deposit at site U-44 and underlying El Bate in site U-27, both sites being small farmstead settlements with components dating to the Taino or Capa period, which is A.D. 1280-1450. to Finally, an unfinished elbow stone, along with several spherolifts of unknown function, were recovered from a recently destroyed Bate site adjacent to the Tanama River. While certain semi-idols, such as the three-pointed stones, have been recovered by peasant farmers from caves and, brought, and bought by private collectors in museums, example, Jesse Fuchs on behalf of the Smithsonian Institution, I have not yet heard of any informants finding them in association with burials. The conclusion is that most of these large iconic artifacts were not buried with caciques or elites and thus remained in circulation. Of course, this observation refers to imperishable materials. There is always the possibility that some semis made of perishable, perishable materials were buried. To summarize, the absence of burial sites of the wealthy in both islands lends support to Oviedo's claim that a large part of the estate of the dead cacique would not be buried with him. The semi-idols, iconic and aniconic, were either to be inherited by kin or gifted to foreign political allies, who would later reciprocate in kind. The only other basis to account for the geographic spread of semi-idols is that of stealing by political rivals or enemies in times of crisis. These are the three key processes that propelled the flow of these semi-icons through a web or network consisting of relatives, political allies, and enemies, some from neighboring regions within an island and others from other islands and polities. In this regard, the three-pointed stones, elbow stones, stone collars, and perhaps the stone heads were part of the material wealth that circulated in a web of relationships that was circumscribed to an area encompassing the Eastern Dominican Republic and the Northern Antilles. The reader might rightfully raise the question of whether it's reasonable to assume that potent, valuable semi-icons would ever form part of the materials bequeathed by a cacique or his kindred, rather than be kept within the chief's family or lineage. Oviedo only noted that a dujo would be buried with the cacique along with his most pride jewel, prized jewels, along with water and cassava. It will never be known for certain, but there are reasons to think that on certain occasions, given the appropriate circumstances, valuable and potent things those one would normally think of as being inalienable possessions were in fact gifted. Evidence in support of this of the thesis that apparently inalienable things were given comes from Hispaniola. Las Casas gave an account of a celebrated occasion when Guarionesh, paramount cacique of the Magua chiefdom, gifted his arieto to Mayo Banesh, the paramount cacique of the neighboring Siguayo Macorish chiefdom of Hiawo. The areto was given in exchange for military protection against an impending attack by the Spanish, headed by Francisco Roldán and Bartolomé Colón, who was the adelantado, a lieutenant governor in charge of territory fronting the enemy. Giving Guariones the areto, lyrics and dance choreography meant, quote, that both caciques were to become henceforth symbolically related as Mayobanesh, in accepting it, would assume and share the genealogy and numinous power of the ancestors of Guarionesh and of the Casigazo of Magua. End quote. Even when Mayobanesh's people advised him against lending protection to Guarionesh so as to avoid certain defeat and death at the hands of the Spanish, in the end all in the end, all agreed they had no choice but to honor the pact because Guarionesh, quote, had taught him the Arieto of Magua, end quote, chiefdom. This was not a gift of material wealth, but of symbolic wealth, one that involved teaching the associated choreography and lyrics of the chants that narrated the great heroic deeds of Guarionish and the Semiified ancestral chiefs of the Magua. 
It was literally an invaluable gift of the epic history of Guadionesh and his ancestors, thereby incorporating Mayobanesh into the history. The caciques also cemented alliances through a ritual exchange of names between two people, as, for example, in the cases of Aguaybana, quote, the elder, end quote, and Juan Ponce de Leon in Puerto Rico, and Cotubanama and Juan de Esquivel in Hispaniola. The individuals would henceforth be reciprocally linked as guatiaos, or guatiaos, a Taino term that the Spanish translated as, quote, friends, end quote, or, ally, or quote, allies, end quote. The Guatiao Pact did not need to be linked to women or wife exchange, but as I will discuss later, there are strong indications that sometimes, perhaps often, the name exchange was also accompanied with women exchanges. Thus, names of caciques and of women, brides-to-be, who were controlled by the caciques along with semi-idols formed an integral part of the alliance-forming exchange network. In conclusion, immensely valuable, potent gifts such as the areto support the, pro the proposition that presumably inalienable valuable, value, valuables such as powerful, reputable semi-idols could have been gifted under the right circumstances. The issues of what may be inalienable versus the issue of what may be alienable versus inalienable possessions deserves further discussion. And we're going to go ahead and stop at chapter 14 because we're definitely past the hour mark, but we'll pick up from here in the next video.